Hi, the purpose of this video is to talk a little bit about the different methods of charging, be it charging by friction, also sometimes called charging by rubbing, charging by conduction, and charging by induction. The first one I'm going to talk about is charging by friction, which means that you've done something where you've taken two different materials, could be something like a piece of fur and an ebonite rod, you rub them together, one of them gets a negative charge, one of them gets a positive charge. This is happening because of the different tendencies of different materials to hold on to their electrons. Some of them hold very tightly. In fact, they'll even grab them from other materials if they can, where other materials just don't hold on to their electrons very tightly at all. So they'll lose their electrons. It's kind of like a chemistry Leo says Ger thing. But what we're looking at here is an electrostatic series that shows a list of some different materials in the order of their tendency to gain or lose those electrons by pulling them off other, other materials. In no way am I suggesting that you have to memorize a list like this. This isn't even some sort of special list. It's just some examples that I'm using. You do have to remember a few critical ones though. Things like rubbing ebonite with fur or glass with silk. And you'll notice that on this electrostatic series that shows that tendency, we see some of those materials. Because I haven't done anything on this list to actually show which ones hold stronger and which ones lose their electrons more easily. So that means that we should end up looking at this <coughs> and try to find those materials that we actually know something about and use them sort of as signposts. So what I notice is I've got ebonite here and I've got fur here. I already know that ebonite rubbed on fur, ebonite becomes negative, fur becomes positive. So what that tells me is that as I look towards the top of this chart, I'm looking at materials that have a greater tendency to gain electrons. They're the ones that, higher up on the top, become negative more easily. They'll hold on to their electrons and they'll grab them from other materials. If I look down here towards the bottom of the chart, these are the ones that I know then have a greater tendency to lose their electrons because they'll let them go, they'll become positively charged because of it. You could look at some other examples then, try to spot them and say, are there other signposts that you could spot. I notice that we do have silk here and glass down here. So that still continues to follow the right pattern, right? The ones that are higher up, anywhere higher up relative to the other material. The silk is going to be negative while the glass is positive. Things closer to the bottom positive, things higher up negative. Now that means if I went through a really sort of extreme example, maybe rubbing wool with brass. They're really far apart on this electrostatic series. That means that the difference between their ability to lose and gain electrons is pretty big. So the brass we would expect to become actually very negative and the wool very positive because of their extreme difference. Besides rubbing uh, materials together to do charging by friction, the other two methods, charging by conduction and charging by induction, are quite different because we have to know some very specific steps about what's going on as those materials uh, get charged. What I usually do when I'm talking about charging by conduction and induction is I look at sort of a four-stage process. That's the way I break it down. I'm not saying that it's exactly the way that everybody learns it or talks about it, but it's the one that makes the most sense to me as far as looking at the overall process of what's happening. So I'm going to be talking sort of about step one, step two, step three, and step four to look at how these materials change as we go through this process. The first one I want to do is charging by conduction. The most critical thing here is that in charging by conduction, the two objects must touch. You say, but that's what we were just talking about, charging by friction, they touch. But there's the difference. When you're charging by friction, you actually have to rub them against each other. Here, I'm not rubbing them to strip charges from one to the other. Instead, what I'm doing is saying that one of my objects has you know, some sort of a charge maybe at the beginning. The other object could also have a charge, but I'm going to start with one that's neutral. And that in the act of just touching them, it allows the charges to move between them. It also means that when we do methods like this, most of the time we are talking about conductors. You actually can do things like charging by conduction with an insulator, but the charges tend to stay stuck on one spot then, right where the charging happened. Whereas when we do charging by conduction with conductors, you see the charges spread around very uniformly. You see different effects happening. We'll be talking about those as I show you these examples. So in my example, I'm going to say that I start with one object 
that's negatively charged. And I'm saying that's sort of got this you know, mythical negative six charge. Don't worry about how it got charged, it just is. My other object is similar. Now that means, remember in physics, same size, same shape, same materials, you know, all that sort of stuff. Everything that we would expect would be important to our experiment. The only difference though is that this object has no charge. They're both conductors though. So I know that if charges are on them, they'll tend to spread around them very uniformly. Right now I'm kind of pretending that the two objects are far apart. Far enough apart, whatever that distance might need to be, that they're not really affecting each other at all right now. In my second step, I bring them so that they are reasonably close. Now notice that the blue object still has negative six charge. It's what's going to happen in this the green object that's going to be kind of different. As this one comes near enough to start affecting the charges in the green object, we're going to see them start to redistribute themselves. And that's going to be a process that we call separation of charge. And I'm kind of lazy, so I just call it sock. It's not like an official physics term, but that's separation of charge. Because remember, in materials, the only stuff that can move around is negative charges. Those positive protons, they're locked deep down in the nucleus, but the electrons, they have a tendency to move around quite easily. By bringing this negative object nearby, I repel electrons that are in the green object, so they'll tend to shift off that way. They'll move away from something else that's negative. So I'll see a buildup of negative charge on this side. The positive charge that I'm drawing in there isn't positive charge that moved over. Those protons were always there. But because the electrons have moved away, I now actually notice, hey, there's some positive charge there. But that's why it's called a separation of charge. We see two very distinct sides with different charges. You might even think uh, from sort of a chemistry perspective about things like uh, a polar water molecule. One end slightly negative, one end slightly positive, but overall still neutral because this is still neutral. You'll notice I put three negatives there, three positives there. I'm not choosing those numbers for any special reason either. I'm just demonstrating that some sort of a separation of charge happens. Now if I took away the blue object at this point, this would just go back to this. Neutral, no separation of charge, nothing. But in my next step, uh, call extension 303. I'm going to actually allow the two objects to touch. Physically, they touch. Technically, if they don't touch, but you see a spark jump between them, the arcing that's going through the air, we're basically using the air as a conductor, that counts, that's good enough. But in this case, by seeing these ones actually touch, what I start thinking about is, this is sort of like a packed apartment with six people living in it. They don't want to all be in there together. It's just too full. Here's an empty apartment. Why don't we move some people over there? Now, if we moved all of them over, now we've just got a new apartment that's jam-packed full of people. We didn't really help anything. So instead, let's just move some of the people over. If we just allow some to move over there, so that in this case, because both objects are the same size, like two apartments that are the same size, if we just go for sort of a 50-50 split of the electrons transferring over to this one, we can then separate the two. And again, moving them far enough apart that they don't really have any sort of effect on each other anymore. And now I've got two things, both with the same charge, same amount of charge, shared evenly between them. The great thing here is that we're also obeying conservation of charge. Because if you think back to the very beginning here, we started with negative six elementary charges. And here, negative three and negative three, I still have negative six. So I've got conservation of charge. This is like a nice sort of like isolated system for us. So everything worked out great. One thing you might want to consider is trying to draw a diagram like this for yourself. Start with this object positive and this one neutral and try to reason out how the charges move around. Remember, positive charges don't move, but negative charges can move around so that it kind of looks like the positives did some moving. It's only electrons that ever do the moving. We can also even talk about you know, little side situations, things like what if the green object was only half the size? Well, think of my little analogy then with the, uh, the apartment. What I could do 
is see a distribution of charge that might look more like this. If I had started with this one being half the size to begin with, I wouldn't see half the charge move on to the green one. I would see a portion move over so that this one being twice the size has twice the charge of this one. Okay? But I would still have conservation of charge altogether negative six. So there's other possibilities out there. A lot of times though we just talk about objects that are the same size, the same mass, the same material. So this isn't necessarily as common for you to have to talk about. The other example I want to show you is charging by induction. Charging by induction, the big deals there are that nothing ever touches. Even if there was arcing, that's no good because arcing makes it charging by conduction. So no touching whatsoever of the objects and we have to use a grounding wire. If you don't have those elements, you don't have charging by induction. So for charging by induction, I'm going to start with the same sort of situation just so you can see a comparison of this to that same sort of starting point, but enough different by charging by induction that you can notice the differences. Now this is the symbol that I'm throwing down as my symbol for a grounding wire. It's supposed to look like a line coming out, like an electrical wire, and this is almost supposed to look like an arrow pointing down into the ground, because literally a grounding wire does that. When we think of the ground, the physical planet Earth, as being like a big reservoir of electrons. If you need to dump some in there, you can. If you need to take some out, you can. So you can just move electrons in and out as much as you want from the ground. The big difference though here is that by having that grounding wire at this point, it does make it an open system. So we do not see conservation of charge happen when we do charging by induction, unless we consider the entire planet Earth as part of our system. But usually we're just looking at this as our system. So we're going to see what in here at least in an open system means that we don't have to follow conservation of charge. Again though, these two objects are far enough apart that they're not affecting each other directly right now. But then I bring them close together, and we see something that at first glance kind of looks again like our separation of charge effect, but it's not exactly the same. And that's because I've got this crazy grounding wire here. So granted, again, we're going to see an effect where the electrons do move away. But why stop? They just keep on going. So we don't see the classic separation of charge where we see a buildup of negative charges there. Those electrons are actually just going to go all the way down the grounding wire into the ground. They're gone. But since they did move away, we'll see that this side is a little bit positive now. Okay, so electrons actually moved down, but they didn't have to build up on one side. Again, if I just separated them apart, the electrons would come back up and this would be neutral again. It would go back to being like this. So I've got to do something. Something special because it's the grounding wire that's now a problem. It's like a fire escape that they ran down on, but they'll come back up if I don't stop them. So in my next image, while still keeping my blue negatively charged object nearby, there's my green one with its kind of positive charge. The big deal. Please call extension 303. Is that I have to cut the grounding wire. By cutting the grounding wire, I prevent anything from going back up. That's the critical step that a lot of people forget about. Cut the grounding wire, trap those electrons down in the earth. Now I can separate the two of them. Notice that the blue object still has exactly the same charge as it started with. It didn't have to transfer any charges to anything, so that stays exactly the same. The green object has a positive charge. It has the opposite charge to my original object, and that's because I used it basically to repel electrons. So when we do charging by induction, we get opposite charges. When we do charging by conduction, if you think back to the one that we had just done, um, we get things with the same sign charge. The other thing that I've done here intentionally is I made this one, you know, negative six at the beginning. But I'm showing this one as positive three. When you do charging by induction, you usually end up with a little bit of a wimpier charge. It's not going to be as big a magnitude as that one, just because we're only inducing charge. So it doesn't work so great. The other uh, part of it here is 
that uh, in this whole sort of scheme of things, um, if uh, I start changing the size of this and uh, try to do something sort of like we did with the charging by conduction one, it becomes a little bit harder to predict the proportions and stuff like that. So I'm just kind of saying in general here that we see a charge that's a little bit limpier. I hope that helps you out with charging by uh, conduction, induction, and charging by friction, and uh, good luck with physics.